start out with thoughts of goodwill. To tell yourself, may I be happy. May my happiness be true. Those two words have to go together. The happiness is the whole purpose of why we're meditating. We realize there's a lot of suffering in life, and a lot of that suffering comes from our own minds, and yet we don't want it. We should respect our desire for happiness, in particular our desire for true happiness, not just any old happiness. True happiness has to come from within. And our desire for happiness is the basis not only for our looking out after ourselves, but looking out after other people as well, wishing for their happiness too. Because after all, everybody else wishes for happiness, and if our happiness is going to depend on their suffering, it's not going to last. They're going to do what they can to overturn it. To the extent to which your happiness depends on thoughts and words and deeds that deal with things outside, that has to take into consideration the happiness of other people. But for true happiness, it has to come from within. It has to be based on something that doesn't change. And the only place you can find that is in the mind. And yet, for most of us, that's just an idea. It's not definitely true yet, but it makes sense. You see things outside changing. How are you going to depend on people who die, age, grow ill, and die, people who leave you, or people who you will have to leave, things that you'll have to leave? One well, thing less is left is looking inside. Now, looking inside is kind of discouraging sometimes because your mind seems to be a bigger mess than the things outside. But it can be sorted out. That's the lesson of the Buddha's life. The basic message of his life is that your desire for true happiness is something that should be taken seriously because it's something that can be fulfilled. It's what makes life meaningful, and it is possible. That's the message of his awakening. So this is why we start with thoughts of goodwill. And we spread those thoughts of goodwill out to other people, family, very close friends. And let those thoughts spread out even wider. People you like, people you're neutral about, even people you don't like. If everybody could find true happiness within, this would be a much better world. And spread that thoughts of goodwill to people you don't even know. Not just people, living beings of all kinds. May all beings find true happiness. And with those thoughts, you clear the ground for the meditation, not only reminding yourself of your motivation for why you're meditating, but also clearing away a lot of the resentments you may be carrying around. Because it happens all too often that when the mind begins to settle down, difficult things start coming up. What someone said the other day, what's, what you did the other day or the other week. Sometimes years past, things come up. So this is to prepare yourself. As soon as any of this stuff comes up, you remind yourself, hey, I'm here for goodwill. I've already wished happiness for that person, wished happiness for myself. Why should I browbeat myself or stir myself up with issues that only serve to heat up the mind, make it uncomfortable? We've got important work to do here. working on the mind's habits that create suffering for itself and other beings. And the first step is to learn how to make the mind quiet, so any other disturbance you just push aside. Focus on the breath, because that's one thing you know is always going to be in the present moment. You can't, If you're watching a breath, you know that you can't be watching a past breath or a future breath. You're watching the breath right now. The mind will tend to hover around the present moment, may not be precisely on top of nothing but the present moment, but it's close enough to the present moment that that's what counts right now. And you don't have to talk too much about the breath to yourself, just enough to remind yourself, stay with the breath. When it comes in, know it's coming in. When it goes out, know it's going out. And work with it a little bit to make it comfortable. Allow it to be comfortable. You don't have to force it in or force it out. Choose any one spot where it's easy to follow the breath. Tip of the nose, the lungs, the middle of the chest, abdomen, 
any place where it's easy to keep track of. Now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And it feels comfortable to be centered there. And then relax around that center. All too often when we try to focus on one part of the body, we tense up around it. But try to maintain your focus even as you relax around that spot. And then try to maintain that spot. It's all you have to do. It's not much. It's simply that the mind is not simple. It's got other issues, other agendas that keep popping in. And you have to be adept at fending them off. It's like that old story of the swordmaster. A student came and said he wanted to learn how to be a swordmaster, too. So the swordmaster says, well, here, go out and chop some wood and fix some food and do this, do that, and had him do chores all around the monastery. And the student was wondering, when am I going to learn how to work with a sword? The master said, don't worry. And then every now and then the swordmaster would attack the student with a stick. So the student got very wary and very alert until one day the swordmaster came up and to hit him, and the student was ready for him, fending him off. Okay, now the swordmaster said, okay, now you've learned to be a swordmaster. You've got to be anticipate the fact that other things are going to come up. And so armor yourself with the right attitude. That this little place of stillness here is really important. You're not going to trade it for anything else. Sometimes thoughts will come in and say, hey, you've got to plan for tomorrow. This is a great time to plan for tomorrow, all this time. Nothing else you've got to do right now. Or you can go and rehash a relationship with this person or that person. All kinds of things you could be doing with the hour, and you've got to remind yourself that's a waste of the hour. The most important thing is to learn how to develop the skills you need in order to keep the mind still here, mindfulness, alertness. And learn how to be very skeptical of the mind's claims to say, this is really important, this, this thought here about the past or the future. you really got to think about this. You've got to learn how to see through those claims. One of the reasons we're so susceptible to advertising outside is the mind is used to all sorts of advertising tricks for itself. Worming its way and saying, really got to think about this, you know. This is really important, or this is really attractive, or this, you're really going to enjoy this thought. Don't believe those things. Most of the thoughts that are going to come into the mind are, are old thoughts anyhow. They're old movies. You've seen them who knows how many times. You really need to see Humphrey Bogart say that again, or whatever he said. You really need to see what happens at the end of this Hitchcock movie. You've seen them many times before. And the th truth be told, your thoughts in your mind are not nearly as interesting as a Hitchcock movie or Casablanca. If they were thrown up on the screen and you had to go into the theater and pay for them, you wouldn't pay for them. And yet it's so easy to drop the breath and go after these thoughts. So remind yourself, you're not here for that. You've seen these movies before, and they're lousy movies. Why bother with them again? As for plans for the future, you can save those for the end of the meditation. After the mind is clear and calm and you really do need to think about something, okay, then you can think about it. But in the meantime, get your mind calmed down, get it clear. Just stay right here with the breath. Allow the breath to be comfortable. Allow your focus around the breath to be comfortable. And then just maintain that. It's a healing awareness, so the longer you can keep at it, the more it's going to heal the mind. So the trick in the meditation is, one, learning how to focus the mind and the breath in a way that feels comfortable, and then two, learning how to maintain that focus, and finally learning how to use it. In other words, once you get really settled here, you can start using this state of mind to open things up inside. to see all the tricks that the mind plays on itself, and specifically the tricks it plays on itself when it's going to cause itself suffering. You would think that the mind would be honest and sincere with itself, but it's not. It's worse than the Chicago City Council. All kinds of tricks, all kinds of political maneuvers. 
this desire comes in, it's almost like it has a mind of its own. That desire comes in. What actually happens is you begin to identify with these things, start really thinking, well, what kind of voice is this? Where is this going to take me? Do I really want to go there? In order to see where these thoughts are going, you've got to be able to step back, which is precisely what the breath meditation is for. It gives you a firm place to take a stance and watch what's coming in and out of the mind. So you can understand, why is it the mind creates suffering for itself? It doesn't make any sense at all, and yet it does. Keep doing this. That's the best use for this concentration. Because when you stop creating suffering for yourself, you don't feel inclined to create suffering for anybody else. The reason we make life miserable for other people is we, we feel weak, we feel threatened. And this attitude, as long as I'm suffering, let everybody else suffer too. Or if I'm suffering, I don't have the strength to do the right thing to help other people. It's just beyond me. It's because you're burdening yourself down with tons of bricks. How can you lift up a brick for anybody else? If you learn to put down your burden, though, it's no problem lifting up that brick for someone else. This is the elegance of the Buddha's teachings. They focus on this one problem, the suffering that you create for yourself, and you find that all other problems in your life get solved. Either you realize that they're not genuine problems that you have to focus on, or you see that it was caused by the fact that you were not mindful, you were not alert. You were too busy creating suffering for yourself to really do the right thing. Once that old habit is gone, then you find it a lot easier to deal with whatever comes up. And there are no problems in the mind. The problems stay in the world stay in the world. You help where you can, and you realize you have to let go, or you have to let go. But it doesn't make inroads on the mind. That's what we use the meditation for. And as for the other issues that may sound more attractive or more compelling, is the world one? Do we have one mind? Are we all oneness together? Even if you tried to answer that question, you wouldn't get anywhere. There's so many issues like that that are out there. What is my true self? Is the world eternal? Is it not eternal? All these issues, the Buddha said, don't go there. It wasn't forbidding you to go there. It was just recommending that if you really are concerned about solving the problems in your life, don't bother with these issues because they're false issues. The real issues are, why is the mind creating suffering for itself? Once this one is taken care of, everything else is taken care of. So that's what you use the meditation for. But to get the best use out of the meditation, you have to be good at focusing the mind and then maintaining that concentration. Because then the maintaining comes the steadiness you're going to need in order to see things. When something moves in the mind, you don't have to move along with it. When you can learn that skill, you've learned a very important one. All too often something moves in the mind, we jump right in like a car that goes riding past. We get intrigued. Where is this car going? Well, let's go. Jump in it and go. It usually, usually ends up dumping us off someplace. We have to come back. Now, oh, here comes another car. Let's jump in this one. Every little movement of the mind, you move along with it. It's like the mind is singing, you sing along with it. But when you learn the skill to stay still in the midst of all the movements of the mind and the body, that's when you've learned a very, very important skill. So that's why we have to maintain our focus. If you stay with the breath for a little bit and then move off whatever comes to it, it's, it's your ordinary state of mind. It doesn't really change anything. It doesn't open your eyes. But when you take your stance in a comfortable way, a way that you can maintain, because you've relaxed around it, it doesn't depend on tensing anything up. And then you can watch as things come in and out of the range of your awareness. And you see how they come, you see how they go, you see what interactions there are that cause suffering, and you can learn how to stop them. Just drop them. So the important work lies in the maintaining. This is the force of the maintaining that shows you new things in the mind that you didn't see before. It allows you to withstand old habits and replace them with new ones. You get to the point where the mind no longer can play tricks on itself, because you're there watching all the time. And so it stops creating suffering, and that's the end of the problem.